My name is Brent Leo Smith. There's a giraffe in the foreground. I have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera. We have Scott Dyson back from his wanderings with Nicola Austin, who is in final control. Uh, we have Kirsten at the helm, and today is going to be a splendid day. So this dry climate we're experiencing at the moment is producing some fantastic sightings around the waterholes of multiple species. As we can see, elephants, giraffe, zebra slightly to the left, there are some kudu. And I have just seen a bird that is going to make the birders go bananas. A lot of our viewers like to keep a long bird list. I don't think this is one that has ever been captured on a live safari before. They migrate vast distances, and it looks to be a red-winged pratten call. There, Andrew. There's another one there. Andrew is struggling to find the pratten call. There we go. It should be a red-winged. There are two species that occur in South Africa, red-winged being the more common. See that very distinct stripe around the throat when he turns. Now, they sometimes in massive flocks of thousands, particularly in northern Zululand and up in Botswana. But there we go. We will have another look at the Pratton calls, but the giraffe... Oh, don't worry, Andrew, the giraffe stopped drinking. But it might drink again. YouTube says, what a great start. Zebras, giraffe, and elephant. And don't forget the kudu to the left, just as important. So these water holes are serious lifeblood at the moment. We are going through the largest drought possibly for the last, I know definitely for the last 20 years, the last major drought was in the early 90s. And before that, I'm not 100% sure. So welcome to today's Valentine Safari. Um, Kirsten thought I was wearing my scarf because it was Valentine's Day. It's not. It's incredibly warm. It's about 92 Fahrenheit, 33 Celsius, but it is quite humid, making it a little bit more uncomfortable. So I've drenched my Kikoi, which is from East Africa, in some water to keep me cool. It's my bush air conditioning. But let's have a closer look at these Pratt & Cores because... Well, we can, I don't think the Pratt & Call is going to move off. We're going to have, let the birders have one last close look, and we'll discuss them more in depth when we get back. But let's go across to Scott so he can wish you a very merry Valentine's Day. Wow. Uh, apologies, it sounds like Brent may have had some bad signal there. And that's why you got rushed onto the vehicle with myself. And I'm called Scott, for those of you who may be joining for the first time. As well as Viem, also known as the Wildebeest, who's also back from leave. So we've got a team of freshly returned Wild Earth employees taking you on safari in this vehicle this afternoon. And really looking forward to exploring with you guys. It's been incredible to witness how dry it's become in just a week that I've been gone. VM has been gone for a little bit longer than that, but VM, you'll agree. I mean, it's got absolutely bone dry. And we've got a time. Right. Yeah, it looks like it's been singed with a blowtorch. Um, there was a thin layer of green grass when, when I left. But now, as you can see, not quite any bits of green left as far as I can see there and I guess that's why the water hole where you were with with Brent is so active at the moment there's obviously a huge shortage of water and it sounds like that specific water hole has been providing a lot of good sightings over the last week and that's what we're going to get up to tonight around the fire we're going to be catching up about all the stories about what's been going on and what animals have been moving where. I've already had a little bit of time to catch up with Brent and James, but not too long. There's a family of hornbills that are just perched on this fallen down tree tar right here. And looks like the one may have a kill in its beak. I can't 
can't tell what it is. Well, the one on the left definitely does. That's a grasshopper. And the one on the right also appears to have something that it may be waiting. Or is it just sweating? No, no, it's the one on the right is sweating. And the one on the left has got that kill, which looks to be like a grasshopper. So starting off the afternoon with a bit of carnage. I know often people love to see kills when on safari. I certainly do. It's something that we seldom get to see. And it looks like it's finishing off an elegant grasshopper there. Good. Well, glad we got off to a good start there. Oh, sorry, Vim. Looked like that youngster just came back and begged for some. You can see the youngster's got a much smaller beak than the adults. That's how you can tell the new newly fledged individuals from their parents, just a smaller beak. And they top back onto the branch to beg for some of that elegant grasshopper. A good time of the year is for the insect eating birds, I guess to a degree. I mean, they get to see their prey easier. There's not nearly as much cover, but then there is a lot less prey around than in a regular summer. That's for certain. There's not nearly as many bugs around. Well, it sounds like Brent has stabilized his signal, and we're going to send you back over to him and those giraffe. Well, there we go. Nice big bull giraffe. I'm sure that's on quite a few Valentine's wish lists. And he's finished his drink and now moving over towards us, coming to come say hello almost. I think on the Sunrise Safari, we did see a female giraffe in the area behind us. I think he might be looking for her. Now we're gonna, oh, there's one taking off. So we're just gonna chat quickly about this bird because this is a really uncommon sighting for the Sabi Sands. Uh, the red-winged or collared, collared pratten calls. And they do like the short grass areas uh, and floodplains, estuaries. They breed normally up in North Africa. The closest breeding population to here is in northern Botswana. There's a zebra calling. And let me have a look, Andrew, there. So it used to be called a red winged pattern call or a collared pattern call. Now collared is the most common. And if we have a look why it's called a collared, under the throat, you see that very light yellow patch and the distinct black collar around. Oh, off it goes. Look at them go. There's a big flock of them. Well, they can be in flocks of thousands, but at the moment, there's probably a couple of hundred here. Nice camera work, Andrew. So the spelling of that bird name is a collared Pratton Col, P R A T. I-C-O-L-E, collared Prattencall. And they are very occasionally in this part of the world, uh, but very, very seldom at this time of the year. So there we go. Let's have a, show you a bit closer look here. And so there we go. If we have a look, there's the collared Prattencall. And you can see that very distinct, how's that, Andrew, I'm in the right spot? There? Uh, you can see that yellow throat and that black distinctive collar. The red underwing, which gave it its uh, other name, which is the red, what's it, red winged pattern call. Now, if we have a look at their distribution here, this is very important. So we are in January, or oh, February now. Sure, time flies when you're having fun. And during February, they become very nomadic. So the green and stripy bitch here is where they breed, and they breed up far north in Africa. And it's very seldom they actually come this far inland in this part of the world. They prefer to stick to the coastal estuaries or to the Makhadi Khadi salt pans in Botswana, the breeding population from there. And I actually am trying to think in all my years, oops, here go my binoculars, in, um, in the Sabi Sands, this is definitely my first Pratt and Call sighting. So really, really exciting. 
that we have our first pattern call sighting. It even rhymes. So another interesting thing, especially because it's Valentine's Day, they are monogamous breeders, even though they travel in massive, her uh, massive herds, massive flocks. Uh, there's been a recorded flock in northern Botswana of over 9,000 individuals at Lake Ngami. Now, even amongst all those other birds, they continue to remain oh, monogamous. Man. And the Ellie's look like they're about to move away. So a very huge, warm and loving Valentine's welcome to Random Stuff. Who's a new viewer joining us on Safari Live. Dust Devil, Andrew, Dust Devil! Oh, look at the pattern calls fly past the Dust Devil. Now we probably, look at how they're using it to hunt for, for insects that might be disturbed by it. All the pattern calls chasing the Dust Devil. Boom, look at that. Uh, we will move if it decides to come right to us. Now, in droughts in Africa, this actually happens quite regularly, especially with the hot weather we're having. And it's probably going to pass just in front of us. We're on the peripheries, obviously, with all the camera equipment we have here. We don't want to get in the middle of that. But look at that. We can feel and hear the wind. Oh, nearly took my hat. <laughs> look at that. A dust devil. The African equivalent of a tornado. We don't get them too often in the Sabi Sands, but uh, in central Botswana, they're quite common. And it's amazing how those pattern calls reacted, trying to grab any insect that was possibly disturbed by that. So what a really fantastic start. Uh, the Ellies are going to move off now, so we'll just watch them as they spread through the bush. And random stuff, I'm sorry, I got really, really sidetracked by that dust devil that came whirling through. Uh, random stuff would like to know what type of giraffe was that? That was a southern giraffe. And random stuff would also like to know what type of animals are quite rare here. Well, we're quite lucky. We're part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. Elephants are not a rare animal. Actually, we see elephants very regularly. And that is a really wonderful thing to be able to say. Hello, little guy. Shake your head. Happy after a nice little cool off in the... Let me just move forward, they're dust bathing. Let me just get, let me just see that mountain of dust. So quite often after elephants have sprayed mud all over themselves, they will dust bath. Random stuff, I'll get back to your um, answer now, but that Eddie's just putting on quite the show. It is a young male. This is quite beautiful. Almost like mist, but not. And once they sprayed themselves with mud, they often spray dust on. And that's to help keep away the biting flies and other biting insects. There they go. They'll now spread it slowly into that mixed woodland and continue to feed. So Random Stuff was wondering what animals are rare. Well, for us to see, because of the times we operate at, animals like art fox, uh, pangolins, serval, caracal. Uh, what else, Andrew? Can you think of anything? African wildcat. Lions. Lions at the moment, but they are around. They just happen to be just outside of our Travis zone at the air, but I'm sure they will be back shortly. And who knows, maybe they'll come pay us a Valentine's visit. Let's continue on, see what else is out and about uh, here in the bush. And uh, very exciting, a new bird species, I'm sure, for most of our viewers. But let's go see what Scotty D is up to. Happy that you had a wonderful sighting up there with the giraffe and the other animals. Good start to the safari, so well done to Brent. And it just goes to show how local knowledge can really pay off when on safari. Um, and 
after just being away from you for a week, I already am lacking the knowledge that Brent and James would have been acquiring while I was gone. So it's a great thing coming back to the bush and then rediscovering what the animals are up to, where everything's moving and kind of finding your feet again. So I look forward to doing that with you this afternoon. Step one out of my list of things to do is to head through the last confirmed area where Karula, a female leopard, had a cub. At least one cub was seen. It would have been just on two weeks ago now, I think. So just over two weeks ago it was seen for the first time. It was seen on a Monday morning, I think, by Brent. And since then, the guys haven't spent much time in the area and I'm not too sure where the cub is or what's going on or whether it's even still alive. So I'm just coming back to check here. Now we're not going to be able to check exactly where the den was, but just driving along this road I'm checking very carefully for any sign of tracks. And if we had a tracks leading back into the, that area it would be a good sign that she is still using it as a den site. That's what I'm hoping to find, but so far not one track on this road. The den was literally just somewhere over to our right over here, in a very steep overhang that then drops down into a riverbed. So she was nestled somewhere just over the lip of this bank and in a small little kind of cave with a network of roots. Told the guys haven't seen much sign of her here, so it's either one of two things she's moved the den site to an, uh, another area, it's highly possible leopardess will move their den sites as frequently as they see fits, and especially when cubs are small, it can be very frequently. So that's a uh, plan or one of the options, which is the option I'm hoping for. The other option is that she's already lost those cubs to one of uh, many, many variables. Male leopards, female leopards, snakes, pythons, hyenas, lions, jackals. So a whole host of predators will compete and kill one another's cubs. Um, as horrible as it may be, it's one of the realities out here. So those are the two likely options. Either she's moved dens or she doesn't have cubs anymore. So either way, we're going to have to try and work that out. And that's why I thought I'd come into this area and be able to cast my own opinion on the situation. <clears throat> oh, well, very, very thank you to... Very, very thank you. A very big thank you, rather, to everyone who's welcomed VM and myself back from leave. It's great to be back on safari with you guys, and obviously, always wonderful to be welcomed back. Speaking of welcomings, we've got two new members of our crew, one of which is David, and he's going to be one of the new cameramen. I think he's probably watching in the final control room now, learning the tricks from VM and Andrew. And you'll get to see him behind the camera soon, I guess. When exactly, not too sure, but he's a new face and member of the crew, which is always exciting to welcome him and him, as well as Leanne, who's one of the crew members who's been a part of Safari Life for a while, but hasn't been up into the field yet. So welcome to Leanne as well. Two new faces in the Sabi Sands, part of our crew. It's always exciting for people to arrive here for the first time after having watched the live safaris or heard about everything. To experience it in the flesh is obviously something incredible and a joy that they're having at the moment. Dinga and Dinga sent through a message a bit earlier inquiring about whether we get the painted snipe ever in the Kruger National Park. And Dinga, I'm guessing that's after the Pratton call that Brent found you that sparked your interest in another bird. Um, 
I've never seen a great sp uh, greater snipe in the Sabi Sands, um, but there is a chance you may get them in certain parts. Let me get it out in the book for you because it's a very nice bird and one obviously that we don't see and therefore if we don't see it nobody knows what it looks like. So, so you get the African snipe and the greater painted snipe, both of which they say can be seen throughout the whole of the Kruger National Park. So both this one, the African snipe and the greater painted snipe can be seen. I've never heard of anyone seeing them in the Sabi Sands. I think there was a corn crake which was seen, which is a similar kind of bird, just on the top of the page here, um, that was seen on a property that I used to traverse in the southern Sabi Sands, but that was a rare sighting, and it was in this kind of flooded grassland that was during a year of plentiful rain, and therefore, because of all the abundance of water, there was kind of grassy fields which were acting like dams, and that's where the corn cracks were hanging out. So maybe in times of an absolute abundance and moisture, you may find animals like the snipes here. They also like marsh swamp habitat, which we don't get much of in the Sabi Sands, but again, in the correct parts of the Kruger, you'll definitely find those areas, and there you'll probably be able to search them out or seek them out. Has found you guys some more animals, so we're going to send you back onto his vehicle. Cool. Good. So we've come across a warthog sounder, and they've got some glorious little piglets. And there we go. Hoping they're going to move out into a little bit more of a gap. Now, since it's Valentine's Day, and we're chatting about different tactics of acquiring a mate. Let me just move forward a little bit. Warthogs, quite interestingly, uh, for a pig species, they employ two different mating strategies. One is the roaming strategy, and the other is the staying strategy. So warthog boars uh, in the roaming strategy will just basically move through from area to area looking for females and challenging the staying boars. The staying boars will use either resource or defend a resource. So the boar for this area probably defends the resource that is Sydney's waterhole. And uh, they can also just defend particular female groups, but uh, a male will have a home range that overlaps with multiple sounders. So what we're looking at here is more than likely a mother which is on the left, closest to us, on her knees, and one of her previous daughters. So the, the females generally stand, tend to stick in their natal groups, and they practice aloe suckling, so, which is very unusual for a herbivore, but because they do tend to stay in their natal groups. So these piglets will be able to nurse from either mom or, mom or grandmom. Uh, in this case, I think, is probably what we're seeing here. And so far, they've been very successful in raising these little guys. Uh, they are a firm favorite of leopard and lion and cheetah. But a female warthog will defend her young vigorously against predators with those sharp bottom tusks you can see there. So the top tusks are all for show. The business end are the bottom tusks, the tushes. And you can see as she feeds, those bottom tusks sharpen themselves against the top tusk, creating a razor blade effect. And it can do some serious damage to any potential predator of her youngsters. Now, as we see warthog, the warthogs on their knees, so there's a thickened pad that develops even in the womb uh, on the youngsters, so they are able to almost straight after birth get on their knees and start feeding. They suckle exclusively for the first two to three weeks, but then become completely uh, weaned at about six months. And you can see that female has got still engorged teeth, so these guys are probably a month or so old, the little ones there. And often said, only a face a mother could love. Oh, you hear that, Andrew? 
Sounds like there's another big herd of elephants on the way. I just hear trumpeting behind us, so let's have a look back at the waterhole. It seems like Jamie's tactic of staying at Sydney's is a very effective one. And while we were watching those warthogs, there we go. Oh dear. There we go. So that red winged or collared pratt call has got Lucy up to. 129 and Marilyn under up to 151 birds for their Juma live drive bird list. Oh, sorry, Lucy 159 and Marilyn 121. I apologize. Here we go. Another herd of elephants is snuck in here. And we just heard that trumpeting. Sorry, Andrew, I know I'm moving, but I think I see something. I just want to check with my binoculars. It's gone now. I saw something that I can't see it now. There was a bit of color or a color that stuck out of the bush. It might have been, and it was quite small. Well, I'll keep checking in case it moves out again. Hopefully these elephants decide not to follow the same route as the others, but decide to come towards our, the northern edge of our Travis area and come and join us on Juma. Do you hear that, Andrew? Doing, doing. Sounds like there's some wildebeest on their way through the bush as well. So, in a draft like this, a very safe strategy is to just almost sit at a waterhole for the whole drive. We won't do that, but we will spend quite a bit of time here. I think definitely once we leave here, we will. We are hoping these eddies are going to come towards us. It looks like they might, and it looks like there's some wonderful little babies with this group. So Marla in Germany is wondering about the ancient roots of elephants in the Kruger and Greater Kruger. And would any of these elephants have that knowledge and be able to utilize that knowledge to help them survive a drought period like this? And would that cause them to break fences? It is possible, but uh, Marla, we are at the moment in, in, within the Greater Kruger or the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. And we're part of a 3.9 million hectare unfenced area where the elephants can wander as they please. Now, that is an area the size of Switzerland. And I think the oldest elephants we're going to get are between 50 and 60, so they would have probably lived through that last serious drought in the 90s. So I'm quite sure that the area has been quite large for quite some time, that the majority of them will stay within that greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park and be able to get enough water and sustenance without having to break any fences. I'm not saying that they won't, but I don't think too many will. Ah, look, it's the floppy-eared herd, Andrew. See at the back, look, the one running in. Oh, see, what, what has she seen? No, I think she's just being silly. So we have seen this herd. Now, very, very distinctive. Uh, heard because of that female who's got that floppy ear. Now, there's a couple of reasons why she might have a floppy ear. An elephant's ear is basically a very thin layer of skin around a tightened, very tight, and very tight around some cartilage with lots of blood vessels and arteries. 
Now, an elephant's ears, like my kakoi around my neck, are an elephant's air conditioning system. So they can have about eight liters, just under two gallons of blood in both. Oh, look at that, isn't that? They just look like they're having a good time chasing the poor Egyptian geese and goslings. Watch out, guys. Those little goslings got to surf a wave. But as I was saying, so there she is. Now, she might have had, she had some physical damage to that cartilage, and that's why it flops like that. It could also be that she was born with weakened cartilage. But uh, those are the two reasons why an elephant might have a floppy ear like that. They found a nice pile of mud there. Oh. Poor goslings. So, hello to Colleen and Shane. And while we're looking with these, this wonderful elephant herd, all full of babies. Shane, Colleen's son, would like to know how long does an elephant carry its young for? It is the longest gestation period of all land mammals, and it is 22 months, Andrew? Or is it 24 months? Ah, oh, just checking. Got to keep, make sure our cameramen also know their stuff. Uh, since I've been filling in for cameramen, maybe we should make the cameramen fill in for the presenters one of these days. Well, the, go the, the geese have made their escape from amongst the elephant herd off to the right. Oh, look at that lovely, cool mud. Obviously cooling them down as well as adding a protective layer to protect them from pesky, biting insects. Linda and Sarah, I think they might see the short-trunked elephant in the herd. Andrew, did you see her? I only saw Floppy. I'll go get my binoculars out quickly and have a squiz. I know that's Jamie's favorite, Ellie, but they are a fair distance from us. And there are more than one short-trunked elephant. I've seen uh, two different ones, actually on the same day, both of them. Um, it is possible that there is a short-trunked elephant in that herd, but I can't see from here just yet. If they move towards us, we might get a better chance. So happy Valentine's Day to Tammy in Indiana. Tammy is wondering, is this the same waterhole James thought he saw a crocodile in? It is Tammy. Tammy's also wondering, why are the elephants so relaxed if there is possibly a crocodile in there? Tammy, because if a crocodile was silly enough to try grab baby Ellie, um, I don't think there's a monster crocodile. Oh, and the next load of waterhole users are arriving. Looks like there's a breeding herd of buffalo about to appear. Yep, breeding herd. Busy, busy here at Sydney's today. But so, Tammy, uh, the likelihood of a very big crocodile, sort of a five meter plus crocodile being in this area uh, of the Sabi Sands is probably quite slim. Uh, it's probably a much smaller individual, two to three meters, if there is a crocodile. And it's a very strong possibility that a crocodile has moved into this waterhole now that the other waterholes have dried up. Oh, look how excited they are for coming for a drink. But I've actually seen elephants chase and, and, and attack crocodiles in Botswana. So a smallish crocodile would definitely not tangle with a breeding herd of elephants. Probably not even big enough to tangle with a breeding herd of buffalo. 
Oh, zebras coming in en masse as well. We heard them calling earlier. We saw some earlier. I think this is a different herd. Those poor geese are being now shepherded from a different direction. Mom and dad trying their best to keep their babies safe. You can almost hear, this way, kids, this way, this way. Oh, no, 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 elephants, kids, this, this, this way, this way. Oh, no, zebra. Thank goodness the buffalo are over there, but now they're stuck. Oh, let's get into the water quickly, quickly. And you can almost picture the geese being like those very overprotective parents who worry constantly about their children and sort of usher them in all sorts of directions, leading the children to want to go astray and disappear as far as possible from mom and dad. You almost write a little skit on that. You can see the way the geese sort of waddle around. Here come the zebra. Now, if I was a lion, this is where I'd sit. But there are other water holes, and it seems like the lions have been favoring the Encora water hole recently. And hopefully they decide to come up north and visit the other water holes here. Now, we're seeing a lot more animals like zebra. than we were at the same time last year. Now, if beyond north of where we're sitting right now is the Manuleti Game Reserve. Now, the Manuleti Game Reserve is generally more open grassland than the Sabi Sands, specifically in the northwest, uh, because of the soil types there, so you get nice big grasslands. But now, with this drought, the water holes that would have been there uh, and would have normally been full at this time of the year, we're supposed to be in the rainy season at the moment. I know it looks like a desert. So it doesn't really look like a rainy season. And the zebra have now been forced into this area of the Sabi Sands. So we are enjoying spectacular zebra sightings and very frequent zebra sightings, as well as the normal array of fantastic wildlife we are privileged enough to spend time with on Juma and Arethusa private game reserves. So fortunately, it looks like the eddies are heading our way. So that's right, Sarah. As I just mentioned, oh look, look, look! Sorry, Andrew. There's a game going on. Elephants chasing each other. Looks like a young bull being chastised. So it looks like the Ellies are going to move towards us. So we're just going to change our position slightly. Uh, hopefully, we get a nice, close view of some of those glorious little bundles of joy. So here comes the elephants. in this little gap and I might move again just judging on where they go from there and I might go flip back a little bit if they might want to cross the road directly where I am well, it looks like they're actually moving through the bush We've got one of the smallest animals around us. And uh, Sarah men is mentioning what I mentioned twice now. Oh, another herd coming in that an elephant's gestation is 22 months.
but this another breeding herd moving in to enjoy Sydney's waterhole. Slightly larger babies here. Here we go. An elephant crossing. Slightly different from a zebra crossing. And, and they're going to move down to drink. And I think that other herd has stopped in that quarry thicket for a bit of feeding. And they've got a glorious little guy with them. So let's go have a look at him. Look like a little male. Shape of the head. Here they come. Hello, guys. Oh, tiny little baby. And I would say that's probably judging from how it's using its trunk mm, and its size. Two months old at the oldest. No, madam. Uh-uh. Put your head down. We're not causing trouble. So it's very important to read elephant behavior. And she looked like she was possibly going to start giving me a bit of trouble. And so I tapped the side of the car, rather stop it. And there, you're correct. That is the short tusked elephant, I mean, the short trunked elephant. Well spotted, guys. I missed that, but now we can see her quite clearly. That is a different one. That, that trunk is much shorter than the one we should normally see. And that could explain her little bit of slight uncomfortable and she's obviously going to find it a little bit more difficult. Oh, there's an elephant fight going on at the water. So we saw that that female wasn't relaxed. Um, she did look like she was actually going to give us a warning charge. But if you know elephants well enough and you can read their behavior, just there's no need to shout. You only shout when you're desperate. Um, you, just a little tap on the side of the car. Uh, stop that situation from becoming a potentially uncomfortable one for us and the animals. So I've seen she's not relaxed. That is not the normal short trunked elephant we see. So I'm going to leave her be and hopefully uh, these other Ellies that are fighting at the moment, chasing each other up and down, it sounded like. It looks like the floppy haired herd is actually going to move off away from our Travis area. There goes floppy here at the back. Very distinctive female for us. So, as those Ellies head off to the north, and we'll get a last few views of them as they move away, let's jump back on with Scotty and see what he's been up to. Valentine's Day timber chopping. I dedicate this to you, Nikki Austin. I'm chopping down this tree for you. Aya! Wasn't as glorious as I would have hoped it to be to snap off for drama, but that should do it. Woo! Elephants. Unacceptable behavior. Bending trees over our roads, creating us extra jobs. Only kidding. Welcome back. Um, this is actually quite tiring. I'm out of breath. Woo! It's not easy to, well, it's easier for some people to make it appear to use those pangas or bush knives. It's quite hard to hit the same spot every time. So that's something to bear in mind. If any of you are shouting comments from the peanut gallery. And that was one of the harder woods of the area, Combretum or bush willow, which is the densest family of trees and the heaviest family of trees, the most hard woods. No, that wasn't very thick. It was incredibly hard. Hello, 
to Steph, who is hoping that we could find some wildflowers. And sure, that's wishful thinking. Oh, yes, son. <laughs> They're not looking very impressive at the moment, but somewhere down there, there are some very dry and shriveled morning glory flowers. So there we go, Steph. But in this dry, arid environment that we found ourselves in, there's not nearly as many flowers around as normal. These ones do open and close, though, so they may be open early in the morning. I think they're closed now because, well, a combination of things, obviously the heat and the fact that it is so dry, but not looking as good as they should, but you may find that in early morning they may be fully, fully open when it's a little bit cooler. The flowers are going to be out at the moment. Not many. The tribulus terrestrius, tiny little yellow flowers are out. They grow on a nasty little thorn that grows in kind of disturbed areas. There's definitely a lot of them, or at least there were a lot of them, flowering on the quarantine clearings when I had it off a week ago. But it'll be interesting to see what's popped up. If anything has since I've been gone, Steph, I'll be sure to keep my eyes peeled. Next year we get some decent rainfall in our summer months and if we do, whether or not you, you think that the grass will grow um, as it normally would or if there's going to be a kind of long lasting effect from this drought. And this, there's certainly going to be a longer lasting impact. Of course, any seed, once it's given moisture, it will germinate and grow. Um, so I, I, I certainly think there will be a, a huge influx in growth, but to what degree there's an influx or maybe there's still some impact of the drought, it's, it's so hard to say, Whitney. I guess so many droughts have happened over the years and so much has changed with the earth that we now know it, that it's hard to be certain of what past trends or what past droughts may have, what effects they may have had and how long it may take for any system to return back to normal. So it's a good question, but one that's very difficult for, for me to answer. You know, you may find that this drought has got a positive Im uh, impact on some vegetation species. And you may find that when there is, in fact, the next rains, that they're going to grow better than they've ever grown before. And maybe that's because some species have given way and died out, and therefore given another species a chance to, to boom. So I think a lot also will depend on the individual species, whether you're talking about grasses or trees or flowers. But I think, yes, certainly there is going to be a long-lasting effect felt from this drought. One area that's usually filled with water is the only area that's got a bit of green on it at the moment, at least on ground level, and that's the centre of the Buffelsook waterhole. This time last year, there were buffalo, uh, sorry, hippo, wallowing in this waterhole. There was a a lot of water around, so it gives you an idea of just how dry it is. Just heard a squirrel alarm calling, and I've spotted a water buck across the way there. The squirrel's alarm calling somewhere in the direction of that water buck, possibly further beyond it. It'll be very difficult for you to hear. I can also hear that it's calling in, in such a manner that it's tired. It, it's not letting off its call that it would be letting off if it's immediately seen something that disturbs it. It's kind of letting off this call saying, I've seen you, I can still see you, I've been shouting for half an hour now, so I'm just gonna do one little Every few seconds. Let's go around there and have a look. I might have to jump off and go in on foot because it is very thick in that little riverbed. But there may be a leopard or something snoozing in there.
be a big African rock python. That would be a great welcome back from Mother Nature. I don't think we've got any big ones on camera so far this summer. Having said that though, we have been spoilt with a host of different snake sightings. random stuff you'd like to know if anybody has ever been bitten by a snake here at camp and no no one uh, part of our team uh, has been bitten at camps where I've worked at in the past it's usually the Mozambique and spitting cobra that tends to bite people they do like infrastructure so that's been the most common snake causing bites or problems in that they can also spit highly toxic fluids into your eyes which require some kind of medical assistance so yeah the, the Mozambican spinning cobra is the number one for random stuff not to worry we have yet to have anyone get bitten and even if we do we're not in such a bad spot here so even if we get bitten by the most deadly of snakes we've still got a good chance of surviving because we are close to good medical help and that's often all you need so not one of my concerns. I'm just gonna stop you for a second. The squirrel was alarm calling somewhere off to our right here. But nothing now. All quiet, other than some hornbills. Can't see them, but they're somewhere around in here. I was just listening to James giving Brenton updates on the game drive radio, saying that there was some bushbuck alarm calling this morning after drive, somewhere below the dual waterhole. So that's useful intel to know. I think Brent is snooping around that area now. Sadly, the quest for any sign of Karula and a new den site or any den site has been fruitless so far for us. Haven't seen one single track of hers, or any leopard for that matter, but that could change. And we've been checking the kind of mainly the, the, the eastern area of, of Juma, the southeastern parts we started and worked our way up the northeastern that's where I'm told she's been hanging out hi there Natalie in England and you've noticed a lot of the pathways that the animals can walk along the one in front of us is a, is a very good one you can see how the road we've just been driving along, and I'm just going to reverse a little bit, just to redo this. This road that we're driving on basically points straight down this pathway, okay? So animals have obviously walked along to it, towards us, and then used the road as the pathway thereafter. And yes, Natalie, most certainly animals are definitely clever enough to use the roads as highways. There goes Andrew with his guests from Cheetah Plain and they will definitely use them bigger animals like elephants and buffalo will probably and hippo will make the pathways and then smaller animals will walk down them but it's just like an easier way of travel it's like us using highways or freeways to get from city to city but once you're in a city you'll use smaller roads to get to neighborhoods and to your friend's house and to the convenience store around the corner so Just like us, animals will use different size pathways or different kind of pathways for different modes of transport or different types of transport. If they're in a rush to get somewhere, they may use a road. If they're not in a rush and want to take a scenic route with a little more cover along a riverbed, that's also an option. So depending on their mood, they will use a variety of the roads and pathways that are available to them, some of which are man-made by us, but we're often made along animal trails. 
And just like our power plays naturally, they tend to lead to something of benefit to any of the species involved. So namely here, for the wild animals of the Salvi Sands and the Krugets, to food in areas of water. So if you follow any major path, that will tend to take you to a water source. to Clown Sharon, who is remarking about a picture that she saw on my Instagram page yesterday, and it was of Nikki and myself at the Ninyala doing a photo bomb with its head right behind us, and you're interested to know how did we get so close to it, and is it normal for Ninyala to be that used to humans? And well, it was quite easy for us to get close to it. It actually came up to the edge of a swimming pool. We were, sit we were in a swimming pool there, and it was probably maybe wanting something to drink or wanting a snack. Um, like most places, uh, I guess, the world over, uh, people tend to sadly break the law of not feeding the animals, and especially now that it's a drought, the animals are that more willing to come that much closer to people in search of a meal. So maybe Clown Sharon had had an uh, idea that we were going to be snacking on some lettuce whilst swimming, that we could casually lob tip, but sadly for the Inyala that wasn't the case. But it's not uncommon, like I've said, in, in rest camps or areas where animals like Inyala or any other antelope hang out, that they do become accustomed with people over time. And I've noticed that especially in droughts, animals will lower their guard drastically uh, when it comes to being tolerant of humans. Okay, well, I've just seen a squirrel. I can still see it now, Vim. If you just look to our left at 3 o'clock, um, there, just sitting up there. So the squirrel's there, well done, you got him. It's just stopped alarm calling, but it was shouting insistently at something in that tree. It's going to be harder to go and take a closer look. What have you seen, squirrel? Is it a snake? Is it a bird of prey? Anyway, hard to tell, but there was a squirrel there. Always good to check it out. Something else, though, that we can check is the remains of a dicycle that Karula abandoned here just before the whole malarkey of her den site and the cub being seen. And it's highly, highly unlike a leopard to leave a kill remaining in a tree like this. You very seldom see anything left behind. So this is a rarity, and we can attribute that rarity to the fact that she was about to give birth, or who knows, may have already given birth, for all we know, to one of the cubs. And that's what caused her to abandon that there, and that's why there's so much remaining up there. You usually don't see anything like that remaining up in a tree. Most will be consumed or fed on by other animals. So we're still on the topic of the Nyala and other animals coming into camp, whether we've had any other visitors. And are another suspect that caused trouble in camps. Um, at the moment, though, we're not really in a very fenced-off camp environment, so we don't see too many uh, few dike that come through not too much at the moment there was a hippo that was trying to climb into our swimming pool um, so, so nothing to, to really report at the moment regarding 
animals in camp. <laughs> well, some of the Juma staff have been doing a lot of road maintenance since I've been gone, so that's always nice to see. The roads have been dragged by a tractor dragging massive tires behind it to smooth out the roads, and it works quite well. So we enjoy manicured road here. lie ahead for us and we're quite fortunate, really fortunate to be able to see this drought unfolding, even though we're in for an incredibly tunnel probably already been battling. Lucky to see what is gonna happen and I feel that this is gonna be a very tough winter ahead. I think we may might to see some animals to start. I'm just going to wait until we're in a better signal area because I'm, I'm not sure if you can actually hear me at the moment. So it's point just me talking to you. So let me just give it a few moments. No good. to know when I will, when I think animals are going to start dying. I think from now, it's, the time is upon us, Tom. There's not much food around, and whatever little bit of food has been keeping the animals going, um, I, I think is, has run out. And even though animals may be looking like they're in decent condition, I think the tipping point is, is, is upon us, and we're going to start seeing a rapid, rapid decline in a large amounts of animals' diets. This again, Tom, is just my opinion, and I've never been involved in a drought before, so don't be confused by what I think and what is actually going to happen. But yeah, the, the time is now. I think a lot of the animals, like the buffalo, are going to already be showing signs of weakness, already being easier prey for lions to catch in general. And having spent a day in the Kruger National Park, traveling further north of where we are here, even there, I mean, there it's dire. There, there's no food. There's just sand. Um, so interesting times lie ahead for a lot of the herbivores. And I think from now, and even already a few weeks ago, certain animals would have already started feeling the effects of this drought. Good stuff. Brent's found a raptor for you. So here we go, a wonderful large bird of prey. Now, this is not the most common one we see here. So I think I'm gonna throw it out to our wonderful audience who can tell me what true eagle this is. So I've given you a couple of hints already. And if you know the answers, send them through via email to me on questions at wildearth.tv or pop a little hashtag in front of Safari Live and use Twitter. You can see its stance is very upright in comparison to a Warburg's eagle. So that is the most common one we get here. So a Warburg's would be slightly more horizontal in its perching stance. This is a very straight-backed ramrod straight Obviously went to a good boarding school, taught them how to sit up straight. 
unlike Andrew. Mm -hmm. I was hoping it was going to fly. How we found it is we heard some squirrels shouting. They were upset with the presence of a predator. And a squirrel would fit very nicely into this eagle's Valentine's meal. And a lot of these eagles are incredibly patient in their hunting tactics. They'll sit and watch a specific area for quite some time. You can see the way it's perched in the center of that tree, that knob thorn, is that it is sort of perusing for a meal. Uh, if it wasn't, if it was perching to roost or to rest, they often perch out in the open where they're quite easy to see. So in the center of the tree, offering it a bit of camouflage, giving it a chance to pounce on an unexpecting scrub hare or squirrel, dwarf mongoose, even some of the ground bird species such as Franklin and guinea fowl. As I said, they're quite patient, and this one doesn't look like it's about to take off, so we'll give you one last nice close look at it so you can work out your IDs. Oh, it seems like everyone's a bit slow on the guesses of this sunset safari. Come on, guys. It's Valentine's Day. So well done to Diane and Khada, who both say tawny eagle. That is spot on. So if we notice a lot of the, the sort of brown eagles or true eagles, they look quite similar. And the tawny, very distinctive, that very upright figure is one of the giveaways. Well, let's continue on. Andrew and I are on our way to one of my favorite spots at the moment because it holds a plethora of interesting things, and that is what is left of the treehouse waterhole and that natural seep and we're going to see if we can find some interesting bugs uh, hello to one of our favorite viewers out there gracie who's eight years old uh, gracie would like to know whether the animals do i think the animals no, it's the day of love. Gracie, I'm not sure. I Probably not. I think every day, if you're an animal, is the day of love and life. But uh, Gracie, I have a very special shout out for you and a very big thank you uh, from James, who says thank you very, very much for his Valentine's Day card. And he's sending you lots of love and kisses. I think, Gracie, you might be becoming James's girlfriend. As I said, we're going to meander off towards the treehouse waterhole. It has been quite hot and very still today. And last time we were there, we saw a really interesting fly species, a nemesis fly that parasitizes wasps. So I think on a very still warm day like today, we might get some really fascinating insects that are coming to drink oh, at the water. Oh, it's, it's going, Andrew. At the water hole there. Uh, off he goes. Sorry, there was a gray hornbill. It was really close to the vehicle, but he got a bit shy. Probably because it's all on his own on Valentine's Day. very quiet away from the water holes we're up on the crest uh, there is still a bit of grazing around up here and browse for the the non-grazers 
but it is very, very quiet after a hot day like this away from the water hole. So while we're moving between water, you might not see too much. And I'm going to take this opportunity, since I have been asked ex extensively to explain and tell the story of my latest cover photograph on Facebook. And it's a picture of me uh, lying about three or four meters away from an adult male cheetah. And that is not too far from here uh, on the reserve I call home. And the reason I'm able to spend, get so close to those animals on foot is I spent a good two years habituating them while walking on the reserve. And it's very interesting, cheetah and wild dog, out of all the sort of large predators, are the ones that take the least offense sort of to humans on foot. And I, there's a very probable evolutionary reason for this, is that, that human beings don't feel threatened by a cheetah or wild dog. They're not really big enough or strong enough uh, to oh, trouble us, but I will tell you about them. And now this is definitely a wonderful little Valentine's creature, but they're being a bit shy at the moment. Let's move forward, Eskosh. You see them still, Andrew? Mm, they've done, oh, there we go, disappearing dwarf mongoose. Well, we won't go into depth on the dwarf mongoose that don't want to be seen. We'll find some that are a little bit more used to the vehicles. But uh, we'll continue with that cheetah discussion. So evolutionary, there was no real competition between humans, uh, cheetah, and wild dog. So I think there's a, a very unique thing that you are able to spend incredible time on foot with those animals. So those two cheetah, or there's a, you can only see one in the photograph, are 100% wild, not hand reared, not kept from a zoo and then released. And wow. Gracie, we might find your boyfriend on foot somewhere here. Yeah? I see the tracking vehicle. So he's out and about here somewhere on foot having a look around. He's not in the tree, which is somewhere we actually quite often find James Hendry, high atop a tree, behaving like a vervet monkey. But, so those cheetah are, it's definitely one of my favorite things to do when I am at home is to go track those guys on foot. I've actually even managed to follow them hunting on foot and see them take, uh, make kills while I've been on foot. And uh, they are incredible animals and very, very lucky to be able to live in a spot like that where when I'm not driving around, Andrew's got some yellow-billed hornbills flying over us. To be able to go spend time uh, in a different reserve uh, and spend quite a lot of time on foot while I'm there. So, on the mention of cheetah, I've opened myself up there. Rich in Chicago, oh, welcome. Uh, would like to know, when was the last time we saw cheetah in this area? I think um, I was the last person to spend a, a drive with cheetah. I actually spent two drives with cheetah. I'm not sure how many months ago. I know some of our loyal followers will know exactly. So, if you guys know when was the last time we had cheetah on the live safaris, Andrew just goes like this, but he does that. Uh, he does that for most questions asked of him. Uh, but hopefully someone out there can tell us uh, when was the last time we saw Cheetah on the live safaris. And uh, you can pop that in an email to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safarilive on Twitter. So we're going to now come off this crest, which is obviously incredibly dry at the moment. And we're going to head down on the edge of the seep line that goes down to Treehouse Waterhole. And I'm going to ask you just to keep looking carefully at the ground. And I'll point it out as I go about how the water tables in this area move. You can see very, very dry here, very little grass, very little greenery. But if we look almost further, the bush seems to be a bit thicker over there. And you can see there's a slight slant in the land going towards there. There's another slant coming like that and another from the opposite side. 
So the main body of underground water that's flowing and feeding that treehouse seep is from this crest here to the south of us. So a dawn is a very lucky fish and she's planning a trip out here in October and she is going to the Sabi Sands and to Pinda. Pinda is a reserve in northern Zululand, a reserve I know very well. My dad is the founder of and I spent my formative years before moving to Botswana living on that reserve. And uh, Dawn, well, Pinda won't be as dry. The drought will still be affecting that area. It's on the coastal plain, so much closer to the ocean. So they generally have a much higher rainfall than here. But there, it's about, as the crow flies, six, 600 kilometers, 700 kilometers. But drought will still be affecting that area as well. It probably won't be as noticeable as the Sabi Sands. But if you are coming and you're coming to see animals, a drought is the best time, specifically for the predators. Uh, it is a time of plenty. Uh, during major droughts, your predator populations tend to increase. Lions in particular have been known to increase up to 20%. Of course, that is because the prey species are having a hard time with very little grass and water around, but it does make life easier for the lions, leopards, cheetahs, and wild dogs, and of course, hyenas, jackals, and other carrion eaters. So we've just been chatting and I'm just going to show you quickly here as we move towards that area where the, the seep sort of culminates and the main body of water flow, flows down under the ground. It's on a duplex soil which means we've got this wonderful sand on top that the water seeps through and then it hits clay. I mean you can already see here even though it, in the draft there is still some greenery and some bigger grass species here. Um, we've got some perennial herbs, you know, dwarf wild sage growing. So on these areas where the waters flow down. So we're going to move on to where the waters bubble up thanks to the help of the elephants. And while we do that, uh, let's see where Scotty is and what he's been up to. Welcome back onto our vehicle. I hear you have been discussing a lot of Valentine's-y things with Brent. Very good. Not much to report here. Um, that's all I've got for now. <laughs> the VM and I were just discussing the fact that if Karula has in fact lost her cubs, which is possible, how easy it can be to oversee a leopard who we even view so regularly as we do. So we wonder how many times she may have lost cubs last year. After never seeing her raise one litter in the whole year, I would speak it ask twice or possibly even three times. Okay, well an abundance of game ahead of us and that's thanks to the gym waterhole which is just off to our right. There's a live waterhole camera. If you don't know about it, it's worth checking out. I just want to get into a spot here. It looks like these two Cape Buffalo are getting ready for a little bit of a debate. One's hugely handicapped in that it's only got half a horn on its one side. It looks like it's got its opponent's hook right in its eye, though. The one on the right's not looking like it's in a good spot now. And again, during these times of drought and desperation, animals' tempers and moods will flare. Not that, that we're seeing that right now, but things can escalate very quickly, especially around water. Hello to Matty, my friend in Ohio, who's just nine years old. I've missed hearing your questions, Matty, since I've been gone. And you'd like to know if I did, in fact, end up taking Nikki horse riding. No, I didn't. Um, but I do plan to do it next time, Matty. Thanks for checking, though, and you're going to need to keep reminding me, otherwise I am going to get into big trouble with Nikki. 
but I hope you've been enjoying the safaris with Brent and Jamie and James, and I'm very happy to be back and taking you out as well now. Oh, be careful, boys. It is Valentine's Day, and we don't need anything too gory here. What we need is a herd of buffalo cows to come onto the scene. Speaking of which, it would be a huge surprise, but I think that could be. It is. It's an old female on the right and some younger ones. And this is unexpected because usually the breeding herds of buffalo will move in massive, massive herds and for only three females or three youngsters, definitely two females and a youngster to be hanging out there, doesn't quite add up. But again, we will start seeing strange behavior between, well, it's especially amongst a lot of the herbivores as these drought conditions kick in. We've got some good news here, and I've just heard a whispering here on the radio that Nancy's Valentine's wish list was to see Baby Wildebeest. And I've got a feeling that there may be some just around the corner here. So, Nancy, you're in luck. Looks like the Juma Wartal cam has already beaten us to them. Oh no, oh no, it's looking at the buffalo fighting. There's the Juma Wartal camera there. And it's watching the buffalo fighting. Well done, whoever the zoomy is, staying on the action as we get the baby wildebeest. There we go. And aren't we lucky to have been able to watch them grow up over the last couple of months. They were basically born, for those of you who don't know, in early November up till late November. That was the kind of main calving period of them. And already, look, just a couple of months later, their horns are protruding. They've changed coloration dramatically. They were a very light brown color when they were born. But now they're looking far more similar to the adults in the background. Still a few shades lighter, I guess. As we sit here watching the wildebeest, we can only wonder about the concerns that they face under cover of darkness when their eyesight isn't as good as their predators. But they've done well, these guys. They've kept quite a few members with, within the herd alive, at least the youngsters. I know on one night, three or four youngsters got consumed. I'm not sure which part of line did it, but it was a three in one. Three young calves all caught the same night, so that was a bit of a blow to their numbers. And speaking of after dark, Maritz is interested to know, do we ever, or does anybody ever go out after dark to monitor the animals or keep an eye on them? And uh, it depends on which camp you're at, but yes, typically most camps in Africa will spend about the last half an hour, 45 minutes of their evening safari with a spotlight. We're a little bit different to that because it's very difficult to film with the spotlight, and we like to take a very inobtrusive position when filming animals, and to film at night with the spotlight uh, does get a little bit uh, or obtrusive, depending on exactly what you're doing. Oh, nice big stretch there. 
come along then. There you go, back to the rest of the herd. So, yes, there's occasionally people that will come out after dark, and again, it all depends on your guide and, and, and the setup that they have with you uh, when they take you out and the camp that you are at. But you will spend time out after dark. Again, though, it can be difficult without good night vision equipment to, to be able to view the animals without uh, being obtrusive, i.e. shining a massive spotlight on either the predator or the prey. As soon as things get exciting, i.e. lions start stalking all the beasts, you have to sit there in darkness, which isn't much fun for anyone involved. Um, so I don't think people are spending as much time out at night as uh, they will in the future when technology allows for it, when technology becomes better and cheaper for nocturnal uh, imaging and thermal imaging. But for now, it's not something that's uh, done a, a great deal, Maritza. Other than if it's just kind of us going out to check if we can see anything just for a bit of a cruise, um, there's not too many people spending time out at night. He just shouted Happy Valentine's Day to me through the final control room. So now I need to say thanks, wherever she is. Hey, Osti! She's somewhere hiding in those windows through there. Huh? She's coming out. We're going to get a rare glimpse of her. There she is! Hey! <laughs> Oops, I'm so happy I stole. Thanks, Austi. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm gonna uh, skip game drive early to start the fire for our dinner. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna send you over to Brent, who's feeling lucky at the bone dry treehouse water hole. to this wonderful little seep and it's really sad. I can see how much the water is going down and down and down. And if Andrew shows you, you can actually see how clean the water is. Over here, and my feet in the way. You can actually see through to the sand. And if I smell here, there's an unfortunate pong of what I would guess to be from the tracks, warthog urine. So you can see from this smoothing over here that someone has been wallowing in this little seep and uh, has urinated while in there. Fortunately, they haven't followed the hippo in defecating in the only little bit of water around. But this water is probably very clean. And um, if I was desperate, I would probably drink this. It has come through this most incredible natural filter. So all this sand that we've got here has, let me come show you a bit closer. So as I said, the duplex soils is sand on top of clay. So the sand is this incredible filter. So a lot of filters that are produced by people use the sand. And you can see there's just a little bit of clay at the bottom. Now this is right at the base of, of this duplex soil system. You can see. So that water, although it probably has a bit of a uric acid taste to it wouldn't do you any harm if you were stuck out here in the bush and just go wash my hands in the uric acid sorry they wouldn't be able to really excavate this anymore because at my hand so sort of at my fingers is where my finger hits clay through the soil and it is actually seeping from in here Wasps in there. That wasn't very clever. As I say that, can you see it, Andrew? Yes. As I say that, one of the Pompilidae wasps is coming for a drink. Now that will give you a nasty sting. And Jamie unfortunately got stung by one of them on drive not so long ago. But anyway, there's not much else about here, but this tiny little bit of water from the tracks we're seeing there is going to create this a sort of almost micro ecosystem around it. And you're gonna have lots of the smaller species that we don't often see uh, coming to utilize this water, specifically at night. Genets, uh, civets, 
even possibly serval, caracal, honey badgers, and trying to avoid the bigger permanent water holes where they've got a much bigger chance of bumping into an apex predator like a lion or a leopard. So, now I know we're going to be continuing to look. Oh, Andrew is being attacked by something. It's a bee. It's a bee. Uh, I just saw this head going like this behind the camera. So we're going to continue on now. I'm going to head down towards the Mawati River system and see if we've got anything around that area. Specifically, I'm looking uh, for a bird for Jamie for Valentine's Day. If anyone's new, Jamie, one of the other presenters, is my girlfriend. She has gone on leave today. But this morning, she was in search of a Valentine's carmine bee eater. So I'm going to see if I can fulfill that for her. But another wonderful little Valentine story coming through is from one of our Zoomies, Tammy. Tammy says she met her husband on Valentine's Day and they have now been married for 40 years. Well, well done. That is an amazing amount of time uh, to be together and a very happy congratulations to you. Also, to celebrate, they've joined us on a live African safari. Uh, so thanks for sending that in, Tammy, and thanks for helping out with the zooming on the damn cams. So a little interesting other fact is that uh, 35 years ago today, my parents got married on Valentine's Day. So a uh, special day for my family and my parents' 35th wedding anniversary today. I would give them a shout out, but they're on their own game drive, so they're not going to be watching the show. So we've got a, a very lovely Valentine's request from Laura, but I'm not going to do it just yet, Laura, because uh, he is on the defensive at the moment. But Laura, I'm not going to give away our little secret about what your request is just yet. I will catch him. Don't you worry, Laura. I'll get it for you. Ha ha ha. Now everyone is wondering, what could Laura's Valentine's request be? Yeah. Oh, the Valentine's requests are coming in fast and furious. Lucy. I just heard that bird alarm call there. Could be an eagle, could be a leopard, could be a lion. Let's loop around towards twin dams. It sounds like it's a couple of hundred meters that way. So, as I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there by the alarming of birds, and they're continuing. Just by the way it's moving, I think it's a bird of, pre a bird of prey, because it seems the alarm calls are moving much faster than, say, a, a leopard or a lion could walk. So, uh, Lucy was after a hyena for Valentine's, and Alice was after a baby kudu. Well, between Scott and myself, we will try and deliver both. And of course, I'm sure everyone is trying not to jinx, but I know everyone out there would love a Valentine's leopard, no one more than me. That's why I'm heading into this particular area where I'm going now, is Tingana was around the southern boundary around here, so I'm hoping maybe, just maybe, he's decided to pop across for the Valentine's evening into Juma. There we go, Bernie requested leopard for Valentine's. Bernie, we will definitely do our darndest to produce said leopard. So 
So I'm gonna do a, a loop through here, down towards the Mawati River system. And if we get no luck there, I'm gonna head up the Mawati and then possibly head west towards Arethusa, see what's happening that side. So Brian has got the most difficult of Valentine's requests we've had so far, and that is for a porcupine. Uh, who knows, maybe luck is on our side this evening as it gets a bit darker. What have you, uh, all the porcupine quills? I think those are mostly collected by Jamie. Uh, she sometimes likes to use them to tie up her hair. And I think that's quite dangerous, personally. You stab yourself. But then again, Jamie isn't nearly as fidgety as me. So as we check carefully for the possibility of Tingana crossing here and a Valentine's Carmine Beater, let's go see what Scotty's up to. So it's cooled down quite a bit, which is enjoyable now that the sun is dipping behind those clouds to the west. So welcome relief. Collected some wood in preparation for dinner. One or two pieces. And for Rizzo, you'd like to know if we can see the Milky Way at night. And yes, we certainly can, especially at the moment, because there's not much of a moon up at the early parts of the evening when we tend to be up. And yes, we've got great, great views of the Milky, Milky Way. But as soon as it gets to about half moon and, and fuller, we don't see too many stars. So there are pros and cons of having the, a big moon up in the sky. It's not usually good for star viewing. But now, like I said, it is great. Who knows, Paul, maybe one day we'll be taking you guys on some more nocturnal safaris where we'll be able to show you the stars. And again, it's just a matter of time, I think, the way technology is going. But it will soon catch up to a lot of ideas that are kind of waiting on technology, similar to this idea, of course. This idea has been around for many years, but technology has only got to a point now where it's actually caught up with the concept. So we've given up on Karula having searched the majority of Juma for any tracks, no joy. And we are now going to try our luck with her daughter Shadow. I haven't heard anything from any of the guides regarding the possibility of her having cubs, but there were rumors and thoughts of somebody seeing her with suckle marks, and it did coincide with a gestation of three months when she was last seen mating with Tingana. Mike Fleetwood, I'm told you are interested to know about Shadow and her cubs. Well, like I said, I don't know anything about it. There have been no confirmed sightings of the cubs, but when I did speak to Ryan from Arethusa, we bump, bumped into one another on leave. Um, he seemed to think that she could have cubs, and she's been hanging very close to the border between Juma and Arethusa. So it's the area we're going to check now. So there's still hope for Leopard. Of course, there's still hope that Karula, of course, has those cubs just nestled somewhere where we don't know. But her behavior has been sounding quite erratic and she's been seen in quite largely spread out areas, not heading back to the same area time and time again. And that is typical of a Leopard without any responsibilities. for 
an incredible view out to the west. And it was quite nice. The first time ever I actually went along with Nikki up onto that mountain range. And I'm just going to look for the exact spot where we were. It's difficult to see, but just out over where VM's zooming into now. A little bit to the left, VM. So that main ridge there, you can see a very slight tower coming up from it. That's where we were. That's an area called Maripskop. Is the exact area. So we were right below that tiny little tower that you could see right at the tip top there. Beautiful views. We thought of you guys all on game drive at the time. Wunderbar. Oh, it looks like it's that stage of the radio frequency that we need to erect an antenna so as to maintain comms with the final control room. Give me a second. Very good. Job done. through this is from Brian you would like to fall in love with a porcupine this Valentine's interesting and I don't like ever rubbing salt in the wounds of other people who are hoping to see something uh, when we have in fact but we did see a porcupine at my friend's house Nikki and I so we we're lucky enough to have some great porcupine sightings at night porcupine ferreting along around. It was probably coming for all of the marula seeds and, and little offcuts that we had discarded uh, off the veranda <coughs> at my friend's house. And Mickey and I had made a lot of marula chutney and marula preserve and marula chili jam while we were on leave. So all of the seeds and parts of the marulas that we didn't use Obviously attracted these porcupine that were coming and feeding right in front of us. Got some really cool views of them, Brian. So they're out here, and I hope we see one today. But if odds are anything to go by, your chances are zero and probably over 450. That's probably how many days we haven't seen one for since we started in November 2014. <laughs> anyway. One has been seen, just that I'm not aware of. But I'm fairly confident porcupine, aardvark, and pangolin are all missing off the list. I don't even know if we've managed to show you a civet yet, but surely we have. Maybe just not me. Okay, so everyone, get focused. This is where we are going to be hoping to find shadow. Oh, there goes a something there. Something or other bird of prey. Too fast for me. And in this area where shadow was seen and there was speculation to having some cubs. There's a network of riverbeds and it's really, really thick and impenetrable. So I think it's a good area that she's chosen. What we'll do is we'll go to Red Dam first. Let me show you exactly what the plan is here. Just need a twig in order to be able to talk you through 
where I think she could be hiding. Schools and while I'm getting a little bit rusty since I've been on leave. No, I don't need the bird app, I need the map app. Okay, so the two big white squares are Juma and Arethusa, our two areas of traverse. This is the boundary. We are the blue dots. I'm going to zoom in onto Arethusa. So, again, we are the blue dots. We're going to carry west along this road to Red Dam over there, and then take Mafunyani onto Southern Fork and come back down parallel road north. And it's in this block here that there's a network of riverbeds, one that flows parallel to this road here that we're going to drive along, and then another one that flows parallel to parallel road north and eventually cuts through over here. So maybe somewhere in this block is where she's hiding. Maybe not. She could be kilometers away, but we're obviously hoping that she's not. And there's only one way to find out, and that is to search for her. So... North Carolina and your wish list is a little bit easier to fulfill. You would just like to see a leopard track. So let's hope we can get that. Certainly easier than finding a leopard. So I will be searching desperately for that. You'd also like to know whether or not my hotel that I made for high-class birds of the Sabu Sands, only the finest specimens were going to be allowed into this premium nesting chamber. Um, but no, none have um, arrived, none have inquired as to a booking, and it is still tenantless. So I've had no joy with my bird box. I think I've chosen the wrong tree. I'm quite happy with the box itself. Um, so my only thing could be the tree that I've strapped it onto it must be in the wrong place, facing the wrong direction. Who knows? But it is with great sadness that I tell you that there are no birds in there. It is going to be successful at some stage, somewhere along the line, somewhere in Africa. Maybe just not yet. Okay, well, always nice to check in at the water holes to see what's going on. Oh, it looks like some Impala had the same idea as us. But sadly, for the Impala more so than for us, there is nothing to see here. And it was just a few days ago that there was a bit of water remaining in this muddy wallow. A week ago, when I was last year, I saw an Impala skirting around the edges, trying its best to find somewhere to drink. It could make a plan, but in just one week it's become bone dry. Very, very bone dry. Richards, interesting question, and one that I have never encountered before. You would like to know, is it true that Impala do not have collarbones, just like uh, most antelope, I think is what you say. And I don't have the faintest idea. Um, looking at the anatomy, no, I do not think that they would have a collarbone. Um, so that is going to be my guess, James. Um, yes, my guess would be that no, they don't have a collarbone like ours, but I can't be certain. If anyone can help me or James get to the bottom of this, we would appreciate that. 
spent too much time looking at the skeletons of the antelope. Thank you very much for your update regarding Karula and her having a small bushbuck kill on Torchwood yesterday. I was told about that by Brent. Um, but thank you very much for double checking that I did get that update. Ellen, what are your thoughts? Does she still have cubs? Or have they been killed and consumed by who knows what? Let us know what you think. Okay, well, you know, keep on the never-ending search for Shadow, and we're going to send you back to Brent to see how he's doing on his vehicle. So as we continue on our Valentine's hunt for Valentine request animals, uh, Andrew and I are going to Valentine our way towards Gallagher camp. James said, mentioned he heard monkeys alarm calling and kudu or inyala barking uh, sometime during the day there. So I'm going to go have a little scurry about. And also, being anywhere near where there's some water isn't always a very good thing at this very dry period that we're going through. Thank you to Khaira and Paul, uh, who have told me the 3rd of August is the last cheetah sighting we had. So August, September, October, November, December, January. It's almost six months, seven months now that we haven't seen cheetah for. Hopefully that changes soon. YouTube. Hi, Viv. Uh, Viv would like to know, is an African civet a bird? It's not. It is uh, the best description I can give you. It is the African version of a raccoon. It belongs to the family Viviridae, so related to mongoose genets and such, but quite a bit bigger. Very beautiful animal. I'll see if I can find you a picture once I've negotiated this steep drainage system. Uh, so, a uh, small carniv carnivorous little animal that is mostly nocturnal, generally only getting moving after about 10 o'clock at night, and then going to bed around 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning. So, generally not operating at the same times as us, but there's a fly that flew into my ear there. But, uh, Viva, definitely not a, a bird. They, interestingly enough, uh, up into the 60s were used in a very cruel, in a very cruel way in the perfume industry. So they used to take extractions from a civet's anal gland uh, to use in the making of perfumes. Not very nice for the civet. Uh, they were kept in very cramped cages, but fortunately, that no longer happens. Well, happy Valentine's Day to Cat in Florida. Cat is asking, do we get ladybugs here? And if so, that is her Valentine's wish. Cat, we, we do normally, but we must remember with this drought we're experiencing, our insect population is not nearly what it would be normally. So unfortunately, I will try, but the likelihood of finding a ladybird is very, very slim. The best chance we had was when we were at the treehouse seep, 
and unfortunately, only thing there was a Pompilidae wasp and a bee that tried to attack Andrew. Debbie in sunny Florida says happy Valentine's Day to her beautiful daughter Zoe, who is a thousand miles away. I love and miss her. Isn't that sweet? Valentine's Day, not only for the lovers, but for the families as well. So Madison, who's 11, who's definitely a human after my own elk, uh, whose favorite animal is wild dogs. And as a lot of our regular viewers know, mine too. I tend to start behaving like a wild dog when they're around, wooing and moving at high speed. But Madison, her question slightly more serious, is, would like to know if, uh, what are wild dogs predators? So, Madison, wild dogs' main sort of predators are the other predators, uh, most, most specifically lions. Lions are the biggest threat to wild dogs, and specifically when they're on a den, wild dog puppies are often killed by lions. Uh, the other predators, leopard, hyena, uh, cheetah, to a much lesser degree, because generally being a pack animal, they're able to see those off quite easily, but it is Lions are the biggest threat to wild dogs, the biggest predator of wild dogs. Not that they ever eat what they catch. If they catch a wild dog, they will generally just leave it. Uh, they don't normally eat other predators. When I say normally, there are always exceptions to the rule. But uh, there we go. It would be lions that are the biggest threat to wild dogs. So we're gonna just pop across quarantine down towards the Gallego waterhole and then pop on north. Actually, I've changed my mind. I want to go the other way now. It suits my plan better. Uh, uh, we're gonna go across to the Gallego waterhole and then up the Buffalo's Hook boundary towards Sydney's Dam yet again. And so that's the last place I had leopard tracks this morning. And it has been, all those tracks have been obliterated by the huge amounts of elephants and buffalo moving through that area. But maybe as it's a bit cooler, uh, the leopard might choose to go have a little drink down at Sydney's. And then if we get no luck there, it leaves us on a nice short, sharp shoot down to the hyena den. And off to Scotty, who's got another Valentine's Day request animal. Well, there's some Valentine's leopard tracks. And I believe they are of shadow. The female we are looking for, the area is correct. The waterhole that she's headed away from, called one Eye Pan. Is one where she is seen fairly frequently, and she's heading south and west down this road that we've just driven along. So I'm not too sure what to do. The tracks do look quite fresh. I'm guessing from sometime during the course of the day. And Heidi, that was for you. I hope you enjoyed the heart around the leopard tracks. It's not very often you see that in the wild. There we go. There's even an arrow going through the hearts. If you look closely, if you're a master tracker, you will notice that. There we go. With love from Shadow and Scott and Vian. Um, 
Oh, what? Well, well, so the problem is... OK, this will explain the problem quite well. Sorry, Ian. Let me just find another stick. So, here we are. This is one I pan, and I'm guessing she's walked all the way down this little road to where she, she is, or we are now, these blue dots. And then she continues down here. So what's going to be interesting is to see where she veers off this road. I'm fairly confident it's going to be somewhere to the south before we get to this road junction. So somewhere very shortly after where we found these tracks now, I'm thinking she's going to cut off the road. But we won't. And Brian in Toronto, I'm happy to hear that you're enjoying my use of the maps. So, I'm guessing she's going to veer off somewhere here. It's going to be difficult to tell exactly where. I mean, even the road now is so hard in front of us. I can't even be sure if she was still walking down even here. But what we'll do is we'll pick a general movement of direction and, and work off that. It is interesting enough heading back into that area where there are riverbeds where I'm guessing she may well be denning her cubs if she still has them or if she ever had them in the first place. Okay, no further sign of these tracks. So short-lived tracking expertise or exercise, but like I said, they could pop up at any stage and by simply working this area it will increase our chances. Tony in London, yes, it appears like the big cats are in fact on holiday at uh, other lodges nearby. Uh -huh. oh. The tracks are still here, so that's a surprise. Okay, so tracks are still going down that road, this road. Good, good prospects and naughty of me to have missed them earlier. We're going to try and focus on exactly what these tracks do, and while we do that, we're going to send you back to Brent. So look what we've just found. It's Peter the Pond Hippo. Look at those huge tusk holes that have started healing on his side, but he's now headed out of the water in search of grazing. And he's not looking well. You can see how his hips are starting to show out there. So he's heading off to find some grazing into the thick bush, and he's definitely not looking well. And animals like hippo, buffalo, definitely take the worst of the drought. OK, let's try it. Have a look. Now, let's have a look here. He's walking down that large path. Unfortunately, the ground's a bit hard to show you the tracks nicely here. And I'll see if I can find some better hippo traps track somewhere else. The ground's a bit hard. Oh dear. Uh, we've had some Valentine's Day uh, alterations made by a herd of elephants at some point during the day uh, to the road. I now am going to find a way to maneuver around it. And uh, I'm just going to try and get through here quickly. And as that hippo meanders off, Maurice is wondering, uh, where do the hippos go uh, when all the water holes dry up? Oh, those are nasty stumps. Um, well, Maurice, uh, they will find any, even little mud wallow to stay in uh, in southern Tanzania. This type of behavior is far more common and it happens every year. And there, any bit of deep shade, uh, a drainage a drainage system, a, a dry riverbed that's got nice big trees, they will go sleep there. Obviously, it's not ideal, uh, but that, that, that's where they'll go. Anywhere that they can avoid direct sunlight for extended periods, if there is no water for them to go into. Hello, Mr. Nyala. Here we go. There's an Inyala walking in front of the Vuyatela rooms. Probably on his way towards the Juma waterhole for an evening and drink. 
or he's soliciting ladies around the drainage line. Uh, they're often in Yala on these thickets on the edge of the little riverbeds. But it looks like he's more interested in having a snack at the moment. Maybe he did his Valentine's this morning. Oh, beautiful antelope with his orange socks. And we're going to let him continue on. And we are nearly at the Gallagher waterhole. One of the most wonderful spectacles you, you can see in the African bush during our dry, I mean, during our wet months or summer months when there's been rain is fireflies. Quite often in little dips like this that we're just crossing through, there are thousands of them sparkling in the night. But Nick is in the UK is wondering, are there fireflies around at the moment? Again, one of the insect species we're not seeing because of the drought. I think if we were on a permanent river like the Sabi River, we might get a few firefighters, but they're definitely not gonna be that many around uh, with the drought we're experiencing. Okay, so James says there were monkeys alarming around here. I'm hoping for a perfect little leopard paw print, but unfortunately none yet. So it's getting to that time of the day when the predators get moving. And you're gonna to have to forgive me. I want to try, definitely get as many of the Valentine's wishes as possible. So excuse me, old buffalo bulls, we shall not be staying with you. And the reason that they are lying in and around the water might be a reason a leopard wouldn't choose, would choose not to drink here at the moment. So I'm gonna scoot off back towards Sydney's. And if no luck in that vicinity, and we'll scoot off down to the hyena den. Andy has another Valentine's request. Any form of scaly critter. Andrew, sorry. Uh, would like to see any form of scaly critter. So, Andrew, eyes open. But Angie, sorry, thank you, Andrew. Um, speaking of Andrew, speaking of Andrew, Andrew Joseph Francis. Now, you heard what was spoken into my ear, Andrew Joseph Francis. Now, Laura, he has been arguing with me, so I'm going to use my stick here, but my GoPro. It's Andrew, smile. Andrew, Andrew, smile. Smile, Andrew, smile. There we go. That's for Laura. That was Laura's Valentine's Day request. Um, Laura, I apologize. I had to beat him to get him to do it. But sometimes one must do what must do to get uh, the viewers what they want. Yes, Andrew. Andrew, put your thumb up. There we go. Now we go. It takes months and possibly years to train a cameraman properly, but I think uh, I'm finally getting there. Uh, a mixture of reward and punishment seems to be the best, best combination of how to train a cameraman. Oh, yes, you just <laughs> You... Andrew nearly made me say a bad word. Uh, <laughs> he attacked me with very smelly insect repellent right at the back of my neck. Okay, Andrew, yeah. the game is on. Oh. See, as I said, I haven't quite perfected the art of training a cameraman just yet. Well played, well played. <laughs> Yeah. 
He's still giggling. And another Valentine's request that we will try to find is a batalea, uh, which is a type of snake eagle. We will definitely keep our eyes open for that for Valerie. But while we maneuver back towards Sydney's, let's jump on with Scott and see what he's been up to. Well, no joy with those leopard tracks. Hard to tell where they ended up going. But at least we had the thrill of the chase for a while. And there's still certainly a chance that either her or her mother or any leopard could pop up at any time. I'm just not too sure where her footprints are currently. That's not to say, though, that she couldn't surprise us, and that is the beauty of being on safari. Because you simply do not know what will happen and or when it may happen. Zoe, you've picked up on that. We don't see cheetah very often, so that's true. And for any new viewers, we don't sadly see cheetah very often here in this area of the Saudi Sands. And I even guess the Saudi Sands as a whole is not renowned for incredible cheetah viewing. Um, so you'd like to know if we ever see their tracks and if they're around, but we're simply not seeing them. And, Often than not, no, we're not seeing their tracks, and it's because they, they, they're not really around. It's not an animal that we are seeing due to the fact that it's nocturnal or it's very elusive, like, for example, pangolin, aardvark, or honey badgers. Animals that occur here, we see their tracks almost daily, but don't see them. And cheetah, like I said, it's simply because they don't occur here very often, so it's not that. We see their footprints, but we don't see them. The tracks are also very distinctive, easy to distinguish from leopard or lion. A lot more narrow, and obviously their nails also show in their tracks, whereas the lions and leopards' toenails do not show. Texas, you would like to know which is the most common out of the four woodpecker that we see here in the Saudi Sands. And possibly the bearded woodpecker I see more than any other, but maybe a toss up between the bearded and cardinal woodpeckers. Tricky question, Sammy. And I do not know the conclusive answer to that. But I do know that somewhere in this book are the woodpeckers and I will get them out here to show them to you. There's only four that we see in the Kruger National Park, the Bennets, the Golden-Tailed, the Cardinal, and the Bearded. They all look very similar, um, especially the top three. They're all very similar sizes. The Cardinal are considerably smaller. But it's either the Cardinal or the Bearded that occurs more commonly here. Or maybe it's just those, the ones that we see and hear more often. Beautiful evening. It's turning out to be, the clouds are very pretty out to the west. That gives you a little idea of the beauty out there. Father Benji in LA, still on the topic of birds, you would like to know if we see hummingbirds here, yeah. and no, we sadly don't get any hummingbirds in South Africa, but we do get a similar kind of bird called the sunbird, it doesn't hover quite like the hummingbirds do, but it's got a very similar bill, curved bill, very similar body size, and very similar habits, drinking nectar out of flowers. 
but none as impressive as the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are localized to South America, as far as I'm aware. Michael Fleetwood, nice to hear your wish list for Valentine's Day being ground hornbill. Had a few great sightings of two different flocks in the Kruger National Park. And so good, Mike, that we're sitting with Valentine's Day as well. I'm going to have a quick look through here for some incredible footage of some ground Hornbills very, very close to the vehicle. Come on. As you can tell, I took lots of photographs. We saw some incredibly beautiful big elephant bulls in the park, along with a host of other things. But it's the Hornbill video that I really want to show you. And we should be getting there. Thankfully, there's not much else happening, so we're not in a major rush, I guess. Who knows, being parked here may be a benefit to us, as we may be able to hear some sounds of the animals around us. Nearly ready there, Mike. Come on, look at the videos. Okay, well, I can't find the videos, but I can take at least on a photographic tour of the hornbills that we saw, but I really want to show you the close-up pictures because it came right up to our vehicle and they were just so pretty. I mean, look at that. Look at the eyelashes. Oh, wrong button. There you go. Welcome back. So that's the ground hornbill in all its beauty. There we go, Mike. It's not in real life. Oops, same mistake. Not very good at doing this. Maybe I should call it a day there. But at least you got to see the ground hornbill. The video, the video I will play with and I will get up onto my Facebook page one day. So that you'll have to wait in, I'm sure, huge anticipation for sleepless nights until that video gets released. Okay, Franklin, settle down. That was a crested Franklin that took off. There's another one just in front of us here. You guys calm down to a panic. We come in peace. Oh, look at how pretty you are. Look at it flaring up its crest there like that. And as far as we're aware, Franklin, there's absolutely nothing to be alarmed with here. We are in a place of safety. to hear that Brent has got him and shortly yourselves into a beautiful sunset spot. Enjoy. So Ellen in Arkansas was asking for the Drakensberg and the sunset. And there we go. We've added one more thing to Ellen's Valentine's request. And it's a bird of prey in the sunset as well. There we go. We're going to have a closer look now. I can't actually see in silhouette what bird it is yet. Um, I'm hoping that it'll turn its head in profile and I'll be able to see if it's got a little crest or anything. Just from the size, I'm going to go with a, probably a Warburg's, but as I said, very difficult in that light. 
And to the left on the top, there's a little forktail dronger keeping the eagle honest. Come on, turn your head for that perfect eagle silhouette shot. I hope you guys are grabbing some screenshots, but be patient. Wait till you can see the... There we go, the beak. And very difficult with the light, but if I had to put some money on it, I'm going to go with the Wahlbergs just based on size and posture. And I was worried that we weren't going to get a spectacular su sunset for this sunset Valentine safari due to the cloud cover that was out earlier, but it just seems to have broken to give you guys this incredible view. There we go. You can see the Drakensberg Mountains, Ellen. Andrew's going to show them to you now. In the distance, the sun setting behind. So, Ellen, there's your Drakensberg sunset. And Ellen was introduced to her husband by a mutual friend, and they've been married for 32 years. So wonderful. So many of our viewers have incredible partners they're able to spend their lives with. And that is one thing I think all of us out here and everywhere in the world wish for. So uh, we did check the Sydney's waterhole. Unfortunately, there was nothing there. So let's do a short, sh sharp dash down the northern boundary towards the hyena den to fulfill a few more Valentine's requests. And I've been desperately looking for a Valentine's flower, but uh, this dry, dry climate, we haven't seen one. Andrew and I have been keeping our eyes open. Who knows, maybe we can pull it off at the last second. This is my favorite time of the day after that, after dawn. It starts cooling down. It is almost an idyllic temperature at the moment. I would guess, what do you guess, Andrew? 20, 24, 25, which uh, for us, warm-blooded creatures that live out here and are very allergic to the cold is about ideal. So we saw that very sad looking hippo making his way out of the Juma pan to try and find some food. And Maggie, who's in Western Australia, is wondering, do hippos ever browse in times of drought or they're strictly grazers? Uh, I actually have seen that hippo sort of eating some of the weeds, some wild basil and, and stuff like that, which is very unusual. I think they might browse but very, very little. They're not as adaptable as something, say, like buffalo that will actively browse uh, things like round leaf teak, uh, mapanis, uh, even some of your bush willow species in times of drought. They are, seem to be far more Catholic in their diet. But in times of uh, stress, animals will do unusual things. Wow, um, Andrew and I were quite far off, uh, and that tells you how much we lack the warm weather. Uh, the weather, actually, at the moment, right now, uh, is 32 degrees. And you might wonder how I can say that with such conviction. We actually have a weather station right next to Final Control. That's 92 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. So, very pleasant for us. 
might be considered very warm for others. Now that is a fine looking specimen of Impala. Specifically in this drought, oh, he's not very, he's a very shy specimen of Impala, but his coat looks magnificent, uh, great color, thick neck. So he doesn't seem to be feeling the drought too much at the moment, probably in his prime, getting ready for the rut come the end of March, April, to produce next year's Impala babies. So while we scoot along towards the hyena den, uh, let's jump on with Scotty and see what he's up to. Well, interesting to hear that Brent is making his way to the hyena den. Because I know when I, <laughs> when, before I went on leave, he hadn't been there once. He'd been avoiding it at all costs. So happy to hear he's had a change in tune. I'm not sure if he has obviously been in the last week that we've been away. That's interesting stuff. Okay, no, he's never been, so there's a first. Aren't you lucky to be taking him to the den for the first time with Mr. Leo Smith? There's gonna be a bundle of joy in there, no doubt. Macy, and thank you for correcting me. Apparently, you get hummingbirds in the Caribbean as well, not just South America. And you'd also like to know if there's any lovebirds around. Sadly, not. But in various other parts of Africa, there are lovebirds. Up in Tanzania and Kenya, you get to see different species. There's many different types of lovebirds. Very cool, small little parrot-like creatures. But I can't remember when, when last I saw one in the wild. It's quite some time ago. And not very common here in South Africa. Richards, you would like to see a chameleon. Now that is doable, but I don't think we're spending out long enough after dark with the spotlights to be able to easily find one with the aid of a spotlight. It's much easier to see them with the spotlights. And on top of that, James, not only do you want to see one, but you're wondering a little bit about how they would have been affected by the drought and the lack of insects. I'm sure they're feeling the effects. Um, Definitely. But it'll be a very, very interesting study to know exactly the effects that the drought is having on them. Here's some zebra that I'll show you. Not the easiest light for them to perform in, but let's just take a moment here. Nice open clearing for them to you know, gradually ease into the night without the huge fear that a lion is going to jump on you. Honestly, in these open little clearings, it's difficult for the predators to sn sneak up on them. And for a zebra, it's also a good space to find some food. And they like feeding on short grass typically. Beautiful.
Okay, the Prince of Bungo, it sounds like, in Florida. We'd like to know a little bit more about how the maps work. And I, I don't know if it is possible for you to follow us, us very easily on uh, Google Earth. I've never tried, and I'm a caveman on computers at the best of times, place of Bungo. Um, and you'd like to know where exactly is the Sibambili cut line on, on, on Google Maps. And all I'd suggest uh, doing is trying to take a screenshot of the map that, that I showed you earlier, and I've got it out again now, and then just trying to work it out from there. Um, yeah, sorry. I would love to be of more assistance, but uh, all I can do is show you the map once more, place of bungle, so you can see how it works. Okay, so a good reference point is going to be right at the top of the map at the northeastern corner of northwestern corner of Juma, Gauri Gate. So that's the main entrance that comes into the northern Sabi Sand. So there's going to be a big dirt road following up to that gate, and then we come into the reserve from there. Then from there, um, the rest is, is self-explanatory. Sibambili is the screen strip to the left. Arethusa is south of it. And our borders with Juma and Sibambili are over here. Juma on the right, Sibambili on the left, or east-west, rather. So I hope that helps you. If not, let us know. Brian in Oregon, let me just squeeze in where Sydney's dam is for you. Um, uh, Karen in Oregon. It's literally, Karen, it's literally straight north from here. It's like Racha, where we cannot see. So it's just north west uh, east of the gates but not on the map so not on that map sadly but it will be on another map over here so there's the gates and there's sydney's dam over there pan dam just north of our northern boundary very good Well, you wouldn't believe it, but Brent is at the hyena den. Enjoy. So there we go, the Valentine's request. Not very active this evening, but we do have one of the sub-adults. It looks like he's got a piece of impala fur, or she's got a piece of impala fur that is being chewed upon. Yes, you. And this is for Lucy, your Valentine's request. Spotted hyena, crow cutter, crow cutter, is their scientific name. And this is definitely a Valentine's animal for the ladies, the only truly matriarchal society we get out here. Look at that, chewing on that piece of skin. Oh, there we go. Another one of the younger ones has popped out and got itself a little piece of skin. So, no adults. There could easily be an adult on the other side of the den. And one of the reasons hyenas are such successful predators is that by far the most adaptable of all the predators we get out here. And they can take advantage of many different parts of the ecosystem. I've even seen them eat fruit. And they scavenge. When it's easy, they're also incredibly capable hunters. And often when they decide to hunt, they have a higher success rate than a lion and leopard.
So spotted hyena in particular have a very long history of interaction with human beings. They've scavenged off us uh, since there's been upright hominids on the African savannas. And there are even cave paintings of them in La Croix in France. So their range was quite a bit greater at one stage, or a hyena family. And they have developed a very unfortunate negative reputation in both Western and African folklore. Now, the most common in the African folklore is the hyenas are the dark witch doctor's pets, the mtarat, the bad, the evil. And witches are said to ride upon a hyena's back when out to commit mischief at night. sniffing around. Now, it's not uncommon to see hyenas of this age away from the, the den site with an adult. Now, what this probably means that this, because this hyena is still at the den, it is one of the dominant cubs. So one of the uh, matriarchal, high-ranking females cubs. So the the low-ranking females actually have to take their cubs away to find enough food, and they often become weaned at an earlier age, where the, is the dominant females are able to get the sort of a lion's share, for a really bad expression when talking about hyenas, uh, of the kills and carcasses around. And the, the less dominant females have a better success rate raising cubs if they take their cubs out foraging with them. And there we can see, this is more than likely a female in front of us. It's difficult to judge from this age. But there is a pseudo penis. So hyenas were thought to be hermaphrodites well into the 1940s, 50s. And that is because the female hyenas have very male-like genitalia. They also have pseudo testes, which is actually their anal part, which they use for scent marking have a very high level of androgen or male hormones uh, and they are often bigger or not often they are always bigger than the male hyenas now unfortunately don't disappear there So Laura and Paul have actually a very interesting question, and that is how are hyena and elephant matriarchal societies dif different? Uh, an elephant is not a truly matriarchal society. The elephant bulls are still dominant over the females. They are bigger, they are stronger, and they are able to push the females around. So within the, the breeding herds, the females are dominant over the younger males. But as soon as a male reaches adulthood, even though they don't spend all their time with the breeding herds, they are far more dominant when with the breeding herds and just purely based on size. Now with hyenas, the males are the lowest ranking of the low. The lowest ranking female hyena is higher ranking uh, than the, sorry, yeah, the lowest ranking female hyena is higher ranking than the, the highest ranking male. If that makes sense, let me see it. I, I'm just getting a little bit confused with high ranking there. But, so they are truly a matriarchal society. The males are the bottom of the bottom. Uh, the males are what disperse. So generally all females in a, in, a, in a clan will be related to some degree, even though they might vary in, in hierarchy stature. Uh, the males will migrate from different clans uh, to spread the genetics around. So, but the hyena females will stay with their natal clan. So, not giving us the best view, uh, lying up at the entrance to the den. So, Ellen. In Arkansas is thanking us for that incredible sunset we got uh, with what I'm pretty sure was a Warburg's eagle and the Drakensberg. 
Uh, it's my, it's our pleasure, our chair, Ellen. Ellen is asking me to describe for new viewers about the advantages of having different aged cubs uh, at the den. For us, as uh, viewers and voyeurs, so to speak, coming to have a look at a little bit of hyena life, it's incredible for us because we're able to see the different interactions and the different behavior as the cubs get older uh, and, and the interactions with the new ones and the mother's different strategies with, with cubs, how the dominance works around the den. It is incredibly difficult uh, to ID individual hyenas very easily and very quickly. So a lot of time is gone into watching this den and figuring out who's who and what's what. And I still think we're not nearly there yet. But hopefully, the more we watch, uh, the more likely we are to understand a little bit more about hyena dens and what happens around them. So at the moment, I think the youngest cubs we've got were born in January. And they are that one, that sub-adult who's lying up there now, I would say it's one of the, probably maybe not quite sub-adult yet, but six, six to nine months old, probably closer to six. And that little one we saw earlier was probably about three, four months old. And of course, the advantage is that they're almost always hyenas for us to look at. Lying up flat there, and I don't think we're going to get too much more action out of here. We'll just wait a few more minutes. There's Andrew checking the other holes for you. So Chantal was wondering, are spotted hyenas the only hyenas that have pseudo penises? And Chantal, you've actually stumped me. I've never actually thought about it. Um, I know that in brown hyenas and striped hyenas, the social hierarchy is not as diverse as, as spotted hyenas. But whether they have that same elongated clitoris that's a pseudo penis, I'm not 100% sure. And if they do, it's definitely not to the same degree. Uh, and doesn't play such an important uh, role in the hierarchy and the movement in the den. And actually, there we go. James has James actually researched that for me, and they don't. Only spotted hyena have that incredibly elongated pseudo penis. So the other hyenas, it's probably more male dominant. Well, I know with, with brown hyenas in particular, it's almost on par in the clan, having spent some time with them in the Kalahari Desert. But it is getting a little bit dark, so let's roll the dice and see if we can find a leopard before the end of show. And let's leave the little hyena toodles. Hopefully the next time I come, uh, there will be a few more around. But let's go see what Scotty's up to while we move out of here. No updates here. At least Brent's first visit to the new hyena den has been welcomed. At least a few hyena. We're making our way up to the Juma waterhole. Um, hopefully there'll be something there, but you never know, of course. But kind of do know because there's a live water hole camera permanently there but anything could pop up at any stage and I guess Brent could get lucky intercepting any animals that pass by the Gallagher water hole which is the water hole closest to the hyena den. But on a hot day like this I certainly could think of nothing better than coming to quench my thirst. that we're not going to find at this water hole is an otter but mark you are interested to know if you do find otters in south africa we certainly do and they 
So they're not quite secretive animals, so not very often seen. You get the Cape Clawless Otter, which is quite a large otter, which doesn't have claws, as its name suggests. And then one or two other otter species, uh, possibly more. Uh, I'm the otter expert, and again, we just don't see them nearly as much as we'd like to. They will, I'm almost certain, occur in the Kruger Park. There'll be various types of uh, otter that occur here, but I've never seen one in the, in the Sand River which is the one river that flows through the Sabi Sands, and then there's also the Sabi River. So they do occur in South Africa. How much in the Kruger National Park, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but what awesome animals, the otters. And that is, a, I guess, the beauty of the planet, not just Africa, is that there's so many interesting animals that roam parts of our planet that are really, really interesting and simply because we don't necessarily see much of them, a lot of them go unnoticed. I think otters being a good example thereof. Florida, you ask a good question. You would like to know why is the one pan on Sibambili called one-eyed pan? I asked myself the same question the other day. Um, there are a lot of strange names <laughs> in various wilderness areas, I guess, um, but that one-eyed pan certainly is one we must try and find out from the Sibambili guys if anyone does in fact know the reason for that. There will be a reason, I'm sure, we just simply don't know it. But well picked up on, and I can't for the life of me think what it could be. Hello, the wildebeest. Look at how dry and dusty it is. And that's scary as each hoof moves. Picks up a cloud of dust. And it's not our first time seeing these little critters this afternoon. We got a glimpse of them a little bit earlier on. And this is the same herd that's just making its way up towards the quarantine clearings from the Juma waterhole just behind us. So Nancy, you got a two and the one. Wildebeest request, lucky you. I think you may be winning the wildebeest or the Valentine's wish list rather. Not that there are any winners. What a marvelous evening. to send a Valentine's shout out to your whole family who are in South Africa at the Vile Dam and I hope they're watching there and they get the shout out if not though at least we'll be able to think about them enjoying themselves on the Vile as well as in Cape Town you've got some more family members down there a little bit lonely in the UK at the moment, but there's pros and cons to wherever you may be on this planet. I guess that's one thing worth remembering. South Carolina has been made for 37 years to Jim and Jim if you are watching Donna has snuck in a special request hailing you as a wonderful husband so well done and congratulations that is an epic milestone Oh, 
marvelous. Look at that. Sharon in Tennessee, interesting uh, wish list you've chosen, a scrub here. Um, okay, there could be one hopping about. This is an area that they do like to hop about. Come on the scrub here for Sharon. It's at that stage of the evening where they'll definitely be hopping around a little bit. It's dark enough for them, but not quite enough to have them out, out in the open. Bertie's now wondering if we could see a bush baby, and yes, of course we could. Cutting it fine though, Bertie, not much darkness around, and we need a bit of darkness for those nocturnal primates to come out. But anything's possible. Who knows, maybe we may even see a cupid flying through the sky. Anything, anything can happen out here. Oh, Impala, not the cupid I was hoping for. So you are wondering whether the drought is going to have an impact on the rutting season of these animals, the impala. And, Lois, yes, it could. Usually in May, every year, the rutting season will commence, leaving about a six-month gestation period until they give birth in early November. And you're wondering if the, the drought is going to cause them to miss the rut or not to rut, and time will tell. There's definitely going to be a few males that are capable of fighting for females, and there certainly are going to be a few females that are capable of receiving those males. So I think the rut will continue for those who are healthy enough to, or those who have survived, and for those who haven't, well, I guess, no, it, it, will, it will not. But let's wait and see. Like I said, I've never been in, in a drought before. So time will tell. And obviously the severity of the drought will also change drastically between now and May, depending on whether or not there's any rain. So I think too soon to make predictions there, from me at least. <laughs> Basically, I think what the drought is going to do is it's simply going to weaken off the, the weak and old and make sure that only the strongest and fittest survive. And there will be, like I said, those strong and fit individuals putting up a fight. It's just going to weed off all the weaklings, I think. Valentine's Day to Mackenzie in Virginia, who's just five years old and a granddaughter, and has been watching the show since they were two. Incredible. Hope you're having a wonderful day.
surprise visitor out of Kendra Drive. That would be a wonderful. to us. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for joining on as we drove around at Juma and Arethusa this afternoon. And I guess I will be out in the morning again with Mr. James. I'm guessing Brent's going to have the morning off, so we'll see you all then. And thanks very much for all the kind welcome back. So it is good to be back. Cool. Over to Brent. See you tomorrow. Blow a kiss. So. Uh what an incredible Valentine's sunset safari. Unfortunately, we couldn't find all the animals you requested, but we did try our best. And uh, I'm sitting atop a termite mound in the African bush, wishing everyone a very merry Valentine's Day. I hope you guys are surrounded with loved ones and love wherever you might be in the world. And a big thank you to all our viewers out there that have sent in all those requests uh, and let us know a little bit about themselves and their lives and the loved ones in there. So from all of us out here on the Safari Live team in the middle of the African bush, a very happy, merry Valentine's Day. Ah. <laughs>